Whoever's not talking will want to go mute. All right, y'all. We are now live. We've got some attendees who are here through Zoom, and then we've got another uh, 15 watching on YouTube. Um, if my connection is slow at all, it's because I'm moderating the YouTube as well as the Zoom, so it might be too much for my Wi-Fi. So I'm going to not show my screen throughout this. Um, yeah. All right, you guys. Ready to take it away? Yeah. All right, guys. All right, let's, do it. let's go. All right, guys. Welcome to the EFT Introduction to Tactical Fitness. Um, currently, we have... We have Coach Ralph, who's right there, Dr. Matt, Coach Dane, and then Jeff. I don't know where Coach Jeff went, but Jeff is actually currently working right now on the streets, so um, he might be in and out. Coach Kelly, uh, she might be joining us. I, I know she had a couple things. She owns her own, her own gym, so I know she's been busy with that with whole COVID thing, but we're going to get right into it, guys. So Coach Ralph and I are essentially going to lead the first half of this, and then we're going to bring in um, – Dr. Matt and Coach Dane, and we're going to integrate it all together. So, so Ralph and I, uh, we, we kind of thought about doing a webinar on tactical fitness. And of course, when anybody hears we're tactical, they think like, like shoes or pants or cry JPCs or like anything, anything to put the word tactical in front of makes it cool. But the actual definition of the word tactical, right? So, it's characterized by skillful tactics, maneuver or procedure, or relating to a maneuver or plan action designed as an expedient towards gaining a desired end or temporary advantage. Now that is the actual definition of the word tactical. It has nothing to do with pants. <laughs> it has to do with desire, a positive desired end or a temporary advantage. That's what tactical means. That's the definition. And then the word fitness, the first definition is health. Second definition is a, capable of a body of distributing inhaled oxygen to muscle tissue during increased physical effort. So our goal is to take tactical, the word in the definition of tactical, combine it with fitness, and then this is what we have. So we're going to break it down. Coach Ralph and I are going to really break it down, especially in the under stress and the vehicle CQB stuff. Um, so again, we're going to go ahead and get started to our first objective, obviously the introduction. This is our motto. Fitness is the foundation of survival because without fitness, well, you have absolutely nothing. Your shooting ability, your hand-to-hand -hand combat ability, your ability to think, your ability to react, obviously is going to be dictated by action and action is only executed by you. So we have to be able to have a solid foundation to build on top of that. That is our motto at Effective Fitness Training. Hey, so, hey, um, so real quick, I like to, let me, let me jump in on that. So, yeah. so for me, guys, fitness is foundation for, for survival. It's the mantra, right? It's, it's the mindset, right? But it's about, it's about being prepared for the unpredictable. That's what it's all about, okay? So we must be prepared to take immediate action with no warm up, no stretching, uh, before we have to respond, right? So I ask those who are watching right now is ask yourself, or I'll ask you, do you have the physical ability to respond without warning, right? That's the question we always have to ask ourselves every single day, okay, is can you run? Can you get into a chase? Can you restrain a suspect, right? How capable are you, are you when duty calls, okay? Ask yourself, are you an asset or a liability? You guys hear us say that all, all the time. So for those that kind of, Fitness foundation survival, what does that really mean? I mean, like what, so for those who are physically fit, you're, you're better, able, better able to respond when called to do so. You can perform work with more, or excuse me, with less effort, okay? You're less likely to suffer injury during physical, during physical and altercation, and you experience quicker recovery, right? That's what it is. That's, that's, that's the foundation, right? The foundation for survival is right there. Ask yourself again, are you an asset or liability? Yeah, and Coach and Coach Ralph makes a great point there, guys. Um, you have to self-assess, right? So that's that's part of it. And part of it too is ego and understanding that it's okay to have weaknesses. You have to exploit them, but it's not okay to do nothing about those weaknesses. 
Um, that is that is the issue. We all have weaknesses, but if you're not working on them, then you're failing. Um, so again, guys, who we are, what we do, our mission is to create effective law enforcement officers and enhance their career by optimizing their performance, limiting injuries, reducing stress through education, science-driven fitness. And this is why we have Dr. Matt, Coach Dane. Uh, these guys are extremely experienced in performance, not necessarily when some people think physical therapy, they think like old people broke their leg. Um, the guys that the guys on our team, they are more geared toward the performance side um, of a fitness of physical ability. So Ralph, uh, Ralph, I'll go ahead and have you go ahead and start us off with the reaction to stress guys. This is our first, our, uh, our first objective. So reaction under stress guys, this is, this is something um, that, we all experience, whether it's minimal or it's a maximum amount, right? But I wanna talk about the examples of stress. We're not talking about stress related to school, related to work, related to family. We're not talking about sudden stress brought on, brought on by the Rona. And we're not talking about that. We're not talking about losing a job, divorce, illness. We're talking about high incident stress, okay? Such as a ma major accident, and for a civilian, right? You see a major accident, what effects are you feeling? What symptoms are you feeling? We're talking about war, we're talking about a gunfight, we're talking about assault, okay? And what are some of those uh, symptoms of stress, okay? So understanding what our body goes through um, under stress and why it's important, really. So, so under the first one, why it's important? It's important to know how our bodies react under stress from a physiological standpoint. If you guys saw one of our last posts, or I mean about four or five posts ago, we're talking about um, some of the symptoms that, uh, that we experience during a high stress incident. Okay. Um, it's important to become familiar with those stress symptoms, those high stress symptoms. Okay. And how to mitigate, mitigate them by breath control. Um, we're not talking about, um, loss of hunger. We're not talking about sweating. We're talking about when you hit that maximum heart rate, when you, when you're, when you're approaching it or when you're exceeding it. Okay. So, it's also important to know where your, max, where your maximum heart rate is, first and foremost, okay? And how you get there is you take, the easiest way to do it is you take 220 and you minus your age and then you get your maximum heart rate, okay? Again, it, it might be um, higher for younger folks and a lot lower for the older folks, okay? So you take 220 minus your age, there's your maximum heart rate, okay? Now, there's other ways to find percentages of that, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. So. Um, what I suggest and getting to know your maximum heart rate is rather than relying on a formula is wearing a heart rate monitor. Okay. Whether it's your Fitbit on your phone or you wear the chest monitors. Right. And the reason why is because it's, it, again, it's important to know when you're approaching or exceeding your maximum heart rate. Okay. And feeling those effects and feeling those effects of stress of a high heart rate. All right. So moving on, so what happens to me under stress? What happens to you under stress? Okay, so like I said, there's a physi physiological effect that happens on the body. It's the sympathetic nervous system, the SNS is what we call it, or fight or flight uh, that some of you guys might be more familiar with. Your fight or flight system is activated, kicks in. And your PNS, which is your parasympathetic nervous system, which helps you relax, calm down, that's gone. That, 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 that puts its sneakers on and it takes off. It's, it's nowhere to be found. The only way is how are you gonna mitigate those symptoms caused by the SNS, caused by the fight or flight response, okay? So um, it's also important to know that the degree of SNS response is determined by your per perception of the actual situation, okay? How confident are you in your abilities? Because what might, might be high risk and high stress to you might be something, oh, I've seen this before to me. I might be able to uh, mitigate those symptoms a lot faster, right. faster recover, and I might have better performance than you in that situation. Not because yeah. I'm better, it's just because of experience and I'm training physically and mentally, cognitively, all those, right? And we'll, we'll get into those in a little bit as well. Right, um, and so, you know, so I want to add to that point too. Um, what he's talking about is, 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 the, is a threshold response. And some people, can naturally have that threshold like that kind of like that higher threshold so and that threshold can be trained but 
It's also like if you were to just walk up to an MMA fighter and throw a swing at them, right? Their threshold of fear in that situation is probably going to be a lot lower. But if you take that same MMA fighter, you put them in like a mountain in Colorado and a bobcat jumps out at them, right? They're, that, that like perception of fear is, is going to be different, right? And so you have to train those thresholds. We also have to know those thresholds. And the way you can get to those thresholds is by realistic training, um, as real as you can get. And that's why people get injured in training. That's why, because if you're, if you're training at a high enough level, if you take anything at, at the highest level, injury occurs, whether it's weightlifting, jujitsu, um, hopefully not firearms training. Um, but, but whenever it gets to like a high enough, high enough tolerance, um, you can kind of start to start to kind of close that gap between having a stress response and actually being able to perform. So it's actually a really good point around that you made. I just wanted to, re- right. I just kind of wanted to recap on that threshold response of fear. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So, but let's not, let's not be mistaken. Now some stress, is legit some stress is good okay so it's that moderate arousal that moderate stress right so it, it's been shown that moderate stress has been known to increase alertness right, right. sharpen focus um uh, memory formation memory retrieval yeah let's scroll down a little bit so folks can kind of see what happens so um so some stress is good right and research has shown that improved sensory awareness that's increased in individuals they have the ability to successfully address a threat right because their 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 senses are aware of not just of what's going around them, but what's happening with their own body and i'll say this for example um i'm sure most of you guys watching right now are aware of that incident that happened in seattle seattle pd where that attack officer was running around the corner and delivered an accurate shot dropping the threat with the baby in his hands that that officer, that sensory awareness at its finest, okay, that's performance on demand. That's because he's physically trained and he's cognitively trained, okay? Now, his stress level might not have been high as we thought because he's been through that training, like I said before, right? He's experienced, that's moderate stress to him, which is crazy to me because, damn, I'd probably be, boom, 200 max heart rate, let me do what I have to do. But he was probably somewhere around, I don't know, 145, maybe 130. I don't know. He's yeah. He was super chill. Dude. Yeah. He was super relaxed. Yeah. I mean, you know what? And, and that also is a really good point because you have to understand in that incident itself, if you actually watch the officer's motions, his reactions, he was extremely calm. Right. I mean, he has, he has either done that before or is tr- I mean, obviously not like that exact situation, but he has been in maybe something similar or has trained at an extremely high level. Um, and that's, I mean, to, I mean, to take a shot like that under that kind of stress after, after sprinting probably 60 yards, um, that was, that was fucking legit. <laughs> yeah, def- definitely, man. I mean, I mean, that was kudos to that guy, man. Yeah. I, I, he'll, I, he'll, 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 he should never have to buy himself a steak ever again. No, no, absolutely not. No, but yeah, guys. So we got this. Uh, so we decided just to take a couple factors um, of physiological responses to stress that may happen. That may happen. Obviously, we talked about every person is different. These reactions will vary per person. Um, I know uh, I have experienced some of these. Um, whenever you kind of debrief with yourself, whenever you self-assess after a situation, you kind of. I like to look back, right? And you say, okay, what did I do wrong? What did I, I essentially put myself on police post, right? And so, uh, and then I say, all right, what did my body do? And where did I lack? Um, Or I have somebody else tell me that was there, right? And they may have a completely different view than from what I felt. Um, So that's also some guys. So we might go through some of these as it pertains to fitness. And then we're going to go as to how you can, how you can, kind of control and train these stress responses, these involuntary responses that could possibly happen and you have zero control, but there are ways to manage those so that you can perform at a high level. So Ralph, if you want to start with the increased heart rate and then we'll just go down from there. Yeah, so so really what, what happens to us, right? Um, oh, what happened here? Can you guys still see me? Yeah. Yep. I got you, bro. Hold on. Stand by. 
Okay, there we go. Lost it for a second. What did I hit? Um, so an, an increase in heart rate is, is that's one of the physiological responses, right? That's, it, it could go anywhere between um, 115, right? Some folks, let's see here, where's this? Give me a second here. So we can always talk about too. Yeah, uh, I lost you guys. Okay, I'll keep going. So whenever we talk about the increased heart rate, I think what he was going to go through were were the different beats per minute and what happens. Um, right. You good back? You back? I'm good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> so we left off, man. So as as a heart recent heart rate increase, we we experience certain things, right? So we experience a slight loss of motor control at around at or near around 115 um, simple tasks such as opening a car door becomes compromised a little bit compromised have you guys ever done some type of force on force training which i hope we all experience just accessing you know some of our tools might be a little more compromised a little bit more slower all right uh at about 145 that's when our complex motor skills tend tend to dip a little bit okay uh that's the hand-eye coordination, right? And then we need to be uh, cognizant of that if that's our weapons transition, right? We're going from different, you know, hand-eye coordination, whether it be with a baton, whether it be a different weapon system, that such, that, that could be compromised, okay? Uh, 150, you're starting to get, that's, that's where you start to get an influx of energy, around 150, that moderate. So we might have an increase in strength, okay? Where we could actually fight for a little bit. But, but, but not to the point where it's going gonna, it's gonna to last, you know, 90 minutes like last year in Aurora, Illinois, where that active shooter happened, 90 minutes, all right? Maybe it can last about five minutes, three to five minutes or so, okay? And as we get about 175, if, if that's your max or maybe even pushing 200, that's when you start getting that, you know, uh, blurred vision, that um, uh, diminished hearing loss, you know, speech becomes like you know you, you think you're talking but you're you're just you're just blabbing so um definitely an influx in heart rate and it and and it it is important for everybody to know exactly what motor skills are lost doing when and how and how what how it how it affects us pretty much yeah right and you know and so to kind of recap on that point there's a lot of i've been to some training uh some very i guess you could probably say novice training uh, whether it was whether it was like department issue training, and sometimes these instructors will say, uh, "You're going to lose your fine motor skills." That is that is completely false, um, because even at a higher level, there's plenty of body cam footage. There's plenty of footage around where you see guys operating what a slide release on their pistol, which is usually like this big trying to find the screen is it's usually extremely small right that is a fine that is a fine motor skill right even unsnapping uh you know if they do have the snaps on their belt um uh for their mags that's that's a fine that's a fine motor skill so to say that your skills go away that's 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 false they can for some they can for some but that can be trained and that's and that's kind of the poor saying so when we say that's why we use the words like irregular or fading because they're still there because there's plenty of again there's plenty of people that train at a high left uh level to where operating a slide release is is a fine motor skill and they do it they've they've done it multiple times right pressing a trigger right that's you know that's one finger so you got to look at these things um you know, even applying tourniquets, those are fine motor skills that we've seen people do under extreme combat conditions, right? And obviously those guys are, are training at a pretty high level. So it's important to, to actually understand what happens. So if you, if you have somebody tell you, you're just going to lose all your motor skills, like you're just going to become a slab of fucking meat, it's wrong. It's wrong. You will not. You can train at a high enough level to where you don't, to where that doesn't happen. And you can actually do what has to be done. Just like Ralph said, is stress can actually enhance performance. Um, and that's and that's extremely important. So that's why it's good to have a good foundation, because if it enhances your performance, then you have a very solid foundation, then 
I mean, the odds are in your favor. You have a temporary advantage, which is tactical, right? So in the situation. So now we can even we can even talk about the you know the blood pressure and the oxygen and the alertness and the sharpness, but let's let's talk about tensing muscles, Ralph, and then let's go into how to combat that. So I'll let you talk about the tensing muscles, kind of what happens in the stress and and uh, and. Uh, hey, hey, you 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 can you can handle that one. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. guys, so obviously when somebody scares you, right? We're going to talk about the shock factor. When you get scared, um, if you guys have ever been in a, in a situation or in a, <laughs> in a training environment where somebody throws a flashbang and you're not really prepared, right, you kind of get that, like, jump, right? So that's, that's not what we mean by tense muscles, right? That's, that's not what we mean. What we mean is, obviously, like, you may find yourself um, – I know f- for me, whenever I was in a situation, I found myself shrugging, like, always, always kind of shrugging, involuntary. And then I had to like kind of force myself that like I would kind of always find myself like kind of tight. Um, and that's just one of my physiological responses to high, higher stress, right? So this is important when it relates to fitness because if your muscles aren't regularly in a tense state and then you go into a tense state, um, that's where the possibility of injury comes in and or catastrophic failure and what i mean by catastrophic failure is you blow out a knee or you blow out uh, anything right and so that could actually hinder the situation which could then lead to a negative outcome so tense muscles is something that you may not be able to control but there are ways to combat that involuntary response. And we're gonna go over that into how to combat involuntary responses to stress. Um, I'll, go ahead, I'll go ahead and hit on the first one. I know Ralph, Ralph's a big high intensity training guy. Um, so again, high intensity training. If you don't do it, you should. I'll let Ralph handle the rest of that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what you're doing is you're, you're actually, again, what happens to us when we, do circuit training, do high interval training. We're, we're increasing our heart rate, blood pressure. We're, we're, we're feeling all those effects similar to a high stress incident. Okay. So a high, what, what your body is feeling physiologically isn't, isn't so different, especially if you're, if you're, if you're new, again, this is intro to tactical fitness, right? If you've never experienced those effects in a high stress incident, you're gonna affect. You're gonna feel them somewhat of the same during a high high uh, high intensity interval. That the the brain can't determine or can't tell the difference between each. That's just you and how you are able to control and mitigate those symptoms, right? To maximize, you know, for for quicker recovery to maximize your performance. Okay, so when we include high interval training, that's exactly what we're doing. We're practicing the breathing. We're moving. Uh, um, um, a high intensity interval isn't so different from running around, helping out victims, helping out a partner, getting our accessing our medical equipment, running back here and there. There's no difference. It's just how we control our heart rate. Okay. Um, you got anything to add on that one? Yeah, yeah on that one. No, Matt, Matt, from your standpoint, um, people that are doing high intensity training. When it comes to the amount of, of time they should be training, um, is, there, is there a point where they can essentially be training too long? Um, so that I guess, I guess what the word is, is they're not quite at red line, but it's almost like not beneficial. Is there like a point in that training where it's like, all right, this person has had enough, essentially, and it's not, it's not becoming beneficial for the person physically? Yeah, so if it's truly high intensity, it's not going to be able to be sustained for a very long time at all because high intensity is something that's done very fast for a short period of time just by nature. If you're doing something that's longer than really like six minutes, it's not really high intensity anymore unless you have rest built into that. So let's say like the workout may be a five minute, three to five minute workout, then you have two minutes rest and you go into something again then uh, just talking about pure length of the actual high intensity session. Yeah, once you kind of go past that point, uh, unless you have rest involved, it's not going to be truly high intensity. 
Um, and yeah, there absolutely is going to be a limit on how many high intensity sessions you can do per week, depending on your goals and what you have going on outside of training. So if you are doing any sort of defense tactics, if you already live in a, in a maybe your job, your job stress is high, all these things are going to contribute to how much high intensity activity that your body can actually handle before developing aches, pains, injuries, setbacks, um, uh, disturbances, etc. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, for the effective fitness, we have probably two to three days a week of high intensity work. We'll have some interval work uh, interspersed in there, and Fridays are just flex Fridays. All we do is just bro work. So, yeah, there is definitely a limit. Everybody's going to be individual, uh, and it really just depends on what else they have going on outside of life. And that's extremely important too. Um, the dog, thanks for that. And so one thing I really want to get into is obviously the exposure to situations and training is going to help with that. The cognitive drills will definitely help combat the stress. Strength training and training under load is something extremely important. Um, and we did a post uh, the other day, two days ago, uh, Dr. Matt, uh, Coach Kelly, and Jeff, um, we essentially decided to talk about the buddy drag or the partner drag and the Jefferson curl. And that was an example of, of strength training, uh, small, so you're essentially taking a task and then you're dissecting that task um, to, to help, help performance, right? So same thing goes like with shooting, right? If you know you're having an issue at a certain, in a certain area, you're gonna isolate that area and you're going to address it before moving on, right? So again, have a strong foundation. So a lot, sometimes we get some people that will ask questions about like, well, I'm just going to drag the guy. If I get hurt, they can just fix me later. Okay. I can understand that concept, but why not prepare for that beforehand? Why not be, why not, why risk injury when you don't have to? <laughs> it just, it, it, it doesn't make sense. So even that tense muscle, that, that stress, like something as simple as a Jefferson curl, which is not done under heavy load at all. It can be done under heavy load, but it's not designed to be. Um, but it can be extremely beneficial, especially when you have to pick somebody up. The situation we used was a situation out in California uh, where, the, um, where the FTO was shot in the neck and his, his rookie had to essentially grab him and drag him probably, I don't know, probably 40 yards. But you can see a clear a clear arch in his upper back. And again, we can absolutely train those because we know that we are not going to be worried about our form when situations like that occur. So we have to prepare our bodies to be like that. Um, obviously, the training in duty gear, training your everyday care, your everyday wear, it's extremely important just to know your limitations, what you can and cannot do. Some guys like to wear skinny jeans and that's on them, fine. But you may, it may limit your mobility. I know uh, I had a pair of pants that, I actually took whenever I went to um, one of Will's classes. Will wasn't there, but it was it was one of Will's classes. Everybody had issues with their pants because it was hindering their ability to uh, to move, to get low to the ground, to actually be able to use the car uh, for cover, uh, and that was a huge issue, right? So that's why it's important to train those things, and that can help combat stress as well. Uh, and probably the biggest one is uh, communication with others. Um, you have a wealth of knowledge here on this on this live feed. This is only half of our team. Um, we have we have Dr. Eve, and then we have uh, Coach Kelly, and then we have Coach uh, Coach Jeff. Um, so again, guys, you know, resources. Ask questions if you don't know. We ask questions all the time. I I I probably bugged the shit out of Matt. I'm like, hey man, what about this? Like, what about this? And Matt's like, quit being stupid. Or he's like, that's a good idea, right? So, um, and then again, guys, this is why we have it team of physical therapists, medical professionals, and guys that have done the job and are currently doing the job. So gain knowledge, learn from others. It's okay to ask questions. Please ask questions at the end. We'll have a QA. and a But we're going to go into Ralph's wheelhouse here. Um, so this is actually something I just kind of wanted to briefly cover, guys. Um, can, I don't know if you guys can see all this. But um, essentially, <clears throat> it discusses Cardiac arrest, cardiac death. And we know that the first term of the word fitness was health. And police officers die all the time because of cardiac events. And it shouldn't happen. Um, could they have been stopped because 
of their diet or uh, continually exercising? Maybe, maybe not. But this is what the data shows us. This is from this is from Harvard University. This is a snippet of uh, I have the um, link below if you want to read the entire article. But I'll read the first sentence, guys. Police officers in the United States face roughly 30 to 70 times higher risk of sudden cardiac death when they're involved in stressful situations. Regarding those situations, suspect restraints, altercations, chases, and when they are involved in routine non-emergency activities. So what does that tell you right there, guys? If, if training to be in those types of situations is your job, then you should train to be in those types of situations. And that's basically all it's saying is the data doesn't lie. Um, and it is about looking good. It is about performing well, but it's also about going home to your family, um, and not, and not having a heart attack on the side of the road. Um, that's extremely important. Ralph, you have anything you want to add to that? No. So uh, as you guys see, you guys read that officer down memorial page. How many officers do you guys see or troopers or, um, agents go down due to heart failure, right? And not Too only many. is it... Not only is it happening during the situation, but it's happening a few days later. So I want to ask Coach Matt, how was the heart affected by a high stress incident? Or even, you know, the same effects you would feel during a high intensity interval training with, you know, what, what effect did that, does that have on the heart? Yeah, you mentioned it earlier. When you go into that sympathetic response, so that fight or flight response um, that that is that la those that doesn't just last temporarily. That is a long prolonged effect that takes a long time and has a lot of will consist of uh, a long period of time. And you can train that to improve, but still, it, it's one of those things that just like training, you you have to experience it. Uh, regularly, if it's something out of the norm and you already have a bunch of high stress that's going on in your life at that same amount of time, it just compounds. It's a compounding effect to where it just continues to build and build and build. So high intensity training can kind of help you almost build your cup. So like uh, we, we use this a lot for physical therapy is you only have so much cup. Like a cup represents your stress level that you can, you can successfully manage. We use it for PT talking about pain, but you can use it for the same exact, same exact thing um, for, for just stress management, right? So I've got, oh, here we go. I got this cup and inside the cup, there's water. Water represents total stress that my body can handle. And essentially what exercise can do is it can help you build the size of your cup over times where you can handle more stress. But if you are already stressed, if you're already not sleeping well, if your nutrition sucks, you only have this much amount of stress you're really stressed i don't i don't feel good like i'm not performing well at my job my fine motor skills are not good but regardless exercise living a healthy lifestyle high intensity work can help you build that cup size where you can handle more stress All right, let's move on. Awesome. So guys, if that is not a reason to work out, I don't know what it is. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to talk about vehicle close quarter combat mobility. So that's what vehicle, for those who don't know what VCQB stands for, it is combat around a vehicle. Uh, this is actually a picture of me. Um, I am the one on the left. And uh, this was a class that I attended with the FBI SWAT team um, who essentially has adopted Will Petty's um, vehicle CQB. We did have Will Petty's permission to use uh, his information as well as his name and all of his mom jokes. Um, <laughs> so guys, uh, yeah. Ralph has attended multiple Will Petty classes. Uh, some of you watching may have attended classes as well. Um, Will is currently a reserve officer in Texas, but he goes around the world, apparently, teaching vehicle CQB, high-risk vehicle stops, um, all kinds of, all kinds of, uh, of, of specialized data-driven training. So we want to do a quick section on this and relate mobility to the CQB, and I'll have Ralph go ahead and go ahead and start that off. 
Okay, so yeah, just like you said, um, VCQB is vehicle close quarter battle, right? Mobility is the ability to move or be moved freely and easily. Okay, so vehicle or VCQB mobility, that's what that is, okay? <clears throat> VCQB mobility is about finding the quickest and most efficient way to position yourself and your firearm around the vehicle, all right? That's gonna increase the likelihood of survivability, okay? Um, but even though we're talking specifically about VCQB mobility, um, according to Will, according to his, his data, principle uh, of patrol procedures, it will always, it still is and will always be about the gun, but we're not gonna talk about that. We're talking about specifically about mobility, okay? If you wanna know more information about that principle, attend one of his courses, all right? So we look at mobility equaling survivability. So it's basically having efficient mobility will increase your likelihood of surviving, okay? So uh, generally speaking, uh, the need to maintain mobility to prevent, you know, uh, muscle imbalances or, or, or alignment issues is vital. And, that, and this, this isn't just VCQB, even though we're talking about VCQB mobility, this is about life in general, right? This is about doing yard work. It's about picking up your kids. It's about picking up groceries. This is just about being more efficient mobility-wise, okay? But um, in an incident where we find ourselves inside or outside our patrol vehicle, um, or, or or everyday vehicle, um, those restricted movements due to tight muscles, right, or the inability of those smaller, weaker muscles to move that body part through its full range of motion is, can put your life, your partner's life, your family's life at risk, okay, if, if we don't, if we're not focusing on mobility, right, whether it be with our lower body, upper body, such and so forth. So, um, so why is this all important to know? So as you guys see in the uh, top corner right there, data tells us that 68% of all gunfights around vehicles are won from the rear of the vehicle, okay? Now, that right there tells us that what? We need to get our asses out of this vehicle and to the back, okay? That's basically what it's saying, I wanna win. If I'm caught in an ambush style attack or I sense one coming up or we're doing a high risk stop, hey, I need to get my ass to the back. That's what the data is gonna, that's what the data is telling us, okay? So with that being said, um, we all know what the rear of our vehicles look like. Whether you're rolling in those Crown Vicks, whether you're rolling in the Chargers, whether you're rolling in the Expeditions, the Explorers, we all can get a clear, clear sense of what the back of our vehicles look like, okay? Um, we know that they're low to the ground, possibly, it's got rounded edges, and it's limited space, okay? Limited space if you have a partner with you, okay? So as we shift over, uh, conforming to your environment, or we can say conforming to our barrier, okay? Uh, conform to your environment, the environment does conform, doesn't conform to you, okay? Or conform to the barrier, the barriers don't conform to you. What does that mean? So. It's basically asking yourself, or you got to ask yourself, how can I conform to this piece of cover without limiting my ability to move? Okay, that's important to understand. How can I, uh, how can I get the most coverage without having to stick my leg far out there, or how can I duck down behind behind the uh, um, the deck of the car without exposing myself too much? Like, oh shit, my inability to squat deep down, is my melon sticking out, right? There's some things we have to ask ourselves uh, around the, the, uh, the cover that we're behind, okay? So we know that if we're at the rear, we gotta be able to get low, okay? Either we gotta be in a low squat, we gotta be then an aggressive kneel, or sometimes we may find ourselves in a prone position, either because we slip, trip, or fall, okay? Um, those are things to think about. We need to get our asses low, okay? Can your body allow you to do so? Uh, uh, freely and efficiently, right? Mobility. Um, so with that being said, that brings us over to the left side. Oh no, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna go there just yet. But uh, let, let's talk about, <laughs> I wanna talk about another principle that's, that's, that's not on here. Um, it's learning to fight from the position you find yourself in versus the position you wanna be in, okay? 
So what, what that means is that whatever position you find yourself in is your mobility putting you at risk, okay? If I have to get low into a kneel or low into a squat, can I do so? Can I stay here for X amount of time and be able to explode at this position as my position becomes compromised, right? Move to right. Uh, a, a position of advantage, okay? So as we're moving through the squat, the aggressive kneel and the prone and the ability to get back up, okay? We can look at it as a, from a strength aspect as well, okay? Where in our where should we be sufficient or efficient and strength in these certain type of body parts? Well, I'll tell you this from experience. I'm sure um, the other folks who, who've taken a course before have, when we're moving around the vehicle left and right, we're filling in our, our shoulders, our core, uh, our quads, our ankles, our calves. We're filling in all those, right? Is, are those positions on your body right now efficient enough to right. move around a vehicle, right? And to get into those varying positions. Right. Did you have something? And I think the, you know, and I think the best way to show that, I mean, obviously, you know, obviously during live fire, um, you are limited because you're not getting fired upon, but the force on force training, um, I believe will really show you, because again, that's, that's about as real as you can get in to a gunfight without actually being in a gunfight is the force on force training. Mm -hmm. If you guys don't know what that is, is essentially, uh, they take those cars, uh, I guess they Whenever I did it, they bust out all the windows, and then they say, one has high side, one has low side, and then you just, then you, you essentially go at it um, from different angles, obviously with different vehicles and stuff like that, but it'll really, it'll really make you move a lot faster, but obviously having good fundamentals prior to, to that type of training is extremely important, so that kind of brings, brings me to um, a separate point whenever you are attending training such as, um, the vehicle CQB is that is that if your foundation is weak, even though like the training levels here, if your foundation is weak, then what you're going to get out of that training may not be this. It may be, you might get there, but you're not going to get the complete value because your foundation is weak. So if you bring up that foundation and you're getting all that training value um, from that. So again, you can attend the best course in the world, but if your foundation is weak, then the actual usable training value you are obtaining is very little, um, or or sometimes none at all. Um, so so you have to make sure that you are at a if you are training at a high level, you need to be at a high level. There is there's there's just no other no talk no words no nothing can give you that except for you and your ability. So um, Ralph actually sent me a text not that long ago. It was actually really good. Uh, whenever we were preparing this. Um, this kind of slideshow he said say goodbye to all your traditional movements and i thought that was that was actually really good so it was so good that we decided to put it in the slide just like the squatting and the kneeling and the stance like you're not going to be worried about any of that ever in right. a situation you're not going to be like you know make sure my, my hips are low you know my knees what if my knees in front of my toes like is, is that okay i don't know i saw some on instagram that said it wasn't like I can, I can promise you, you're not going to think about any of that. So you, we, that's why it's important to train those things. And that's why it's important to train those things in a safe environment. So I'll have Ralph go ahead and kind of take that over. But that was, I thought that was a really good point that you made, man. Yeah. So, so what I mean, yeah, again, those traditional movements, right. Is when you get out of the Academy, what are they still teaching you guys during in-service? The traditional lunge, the squat, maybe you're not even squatting. Right. What does your kneeling look like? It's just that straight on right leg in front. OK, now let's put your ass behind a vehicle. And you get into that traditional kneel. What do you have to do? Oh, crap. The vehicle is still in front of me. Now I got to reach over on my waist and now I'm, I'm smoking my core. Now I'm in a bad, unstable position, especially if I have to move or I have a buddy next to me. That's that you're compromised. OK, so being able to take the aggressive kneel where if I'm lining up offset to, let's say the rear uh, light, the, the bumper, okay? I want my left leg, as soon as I step it, not straight, but a little bit out, I'm already on the edge of that bumper, right? I'm not sticking out to where the suspect can see me. All I have to do is put a little more put, push on that left knee and I'm able to come out on, 
off cover, right, or on the side of that cover, I should say, without having to lean so much, okay? And as with my right leg, I'm sticking it out. I'm not sticking it straight back. That's that aggressive. You can, you can call that a squat, but once you touch that knee to the ground, that's a kneel. That's what I'm talking about. We need to start teaching our guys or training yourselves and being a little bit more um, non-traditional when it comes to movement, right? Not everything is a perfect squat. and not, that, That's great to practice in the gym but is that relatable outside in a high risk incident around especially around a vehicle okay so All right moving forward um yeah down um, the quote yeah. yeah well let's hey let me let me let me talk real quick on um sure. the quote from will so that actually sure, right yeah, there sure. that is that is another principle i know i probably said about four or five of them but i'll quote them uh movement must be tactical and decision athletic in motion and safe in the environment, okay? I'm not gonna talk about tactical decision or safe in the environment. If you wanna know more about that, you can hit up Will on his page or you can attend one of his courses. What I wanna highlight is movement must be athletic in motion, right? So, so what does that mean? So a question we have to ask ourselves is once we commit to move, whether it's to a position of advantage, more cover, to a buddy, whatever it is, once we made that tactical decision to move or that commitment, I should say, can our bodies be prepared to do so? Okay. And I've seen it firsthand in courses or in real life where I want to move somewhere. I have to go respond and your body can't like, I think we, I think we put up a video not a long, or probably like last year where they're, they're chasing after a suspect and a cop trips. It's not because he's clumsy. His body is not prepared to move his body. He's not pre prepared of, of training under load. Right. That, that sort of thing. Maybe he's, you know, pulled a hamstring because his hamstrings are weak. You know, there's a lot of things that can happen. That's one of the questions we have to ask ourselves all the time is if I ever commit to a, to a, to a movement, can my body uh, take me there, right? So as we're moving, okay, we shouldn't be the walking dead out there. We shouldn't be the, you know, looking like our knees are locked. We shouldn't be, right? We, it should be athletic. It should be low to the ground, knees bent, explosive with each stride, okay? Good, and that's that's. I'll, I'll let Matt kind of talk about it a little bit towards the end on on. Well, I'm sure towards programming you know, on why we program agility in our in our program, and this this is exactly why, right? So we want to be able to be uh, explosive to reach stride. Um, as we begin to stop, do we want to just abruptly stop? No. Why? We could slip. Why? It, all, that, all that force from our weight, all that force from running, for all the gear that we're wearing on our belt, on our hips, uh, um, on, our, on our chest, our weapon system, right? W what, what can happen when we, when we break suddenly, right? We can risk slipping or we can risk injury to what? The, the, your muscles, your tendons, your ligaments, um, joints, maybe your ACL because you're, you're, you wanted to change direction as you stop, right? Those are some things we need to think about. That's why we need to start focusing more on lower body strength, right? Uh, so when we're stopping, the goal is to, well, let me say this. Instead of stopping abruptly, we need to start taking those, those series of small steps, those choppy steps. That's why you see people, and, you know, some on YouTube video, I'm like, oh, why they're so choppy? Well, it's because they're controlling the force production, right? That's what they're trying to do. They don't want to stop so much to the point where they risk slipping. And I've seen videos where dude running and they're trying to do some cool ass slide yeah it looks cool and they shoot it you know really i'm, I'm not going to do that in a real life situation i don't want to become compromised and make myself a liability because i try to look cool or did something stupid or something i saw on, on an ig video or a youtube video okay we need we need to be a little bit smarter guys so um the ability to keep the hamstrings is critical because where is all the force right when we're stopping we kind of tend to get into that that backwards right say i don't know if you ever guys played football, played soccer, when we start to break, we start to lean back a little bit. A lot of a lot of stress is on the hamstrings. I know I popped my hamstring, I don't know, about 10 years ago, weekend warrior playing softball. Yeah, that's right, I said it's softball, okay? Stopping, pop the hamstring, and, and it sucks, right? I wasn't able to play, wasn't able to work, had to take some time off, so on and so forth. I'm sure um, most of us have, have, have experienced that in our lives before. So you gotta ask yourself right now, once you commit to movement, is your body prepared to do so? Do you have the ability to accelerate and deaccelerate efficiently and effectively? All right. Right.
And you know why that's extremely important. Um, you know, the physical speed necessity is is you have to be able to conform to the situation. So if you're not moving at the speed necessary to complete the task, then you risk being compromised and putting you at a putting you at a disadvantage. I'm gonna I'm gonna go down to the next slide. Um, some so there was a I was actually talking to Will on the phone and we were just shooting the shit probably about eight months ago. Um, and and he just kind of said this said this and it just it made perfect sense it was so like so common sense that i was like dude that's freaking brilliant i like just it was just the way he said it and from obviously from a mobility standpoint standing is better than squatting squatting is better than kneeling kneeling is better than prone um obviously the situation dictates that obviously you might have to go straight to prone and you know in some circumstances but this is a this is a um uh, a great piece of uh uh, art, I guess you could call it, to kind of just kind of demonstrate possible body movements that you may be in, uh, in a situation and having to get out of those. And that's kind of what Ralph was talking about was if, if you have to go from prone to standing, how quickly can you do that depending on the situation? Um, and so, you know, again, this is a, a, a drill called alphabet soup drill. Uh, it's hectic chaos. It's Again, it's not necessarily meant for tactics. It's, it's actually, I what I took away from it whenever I went through it was more of body positioning um, and kind of understanding about like where where I was um, in relation to the threat, in relation to, uh, to the pillars, in relation to the vehicle. So it was really good for me, but whenever he said that, from a purely a mobility standpoint, obviously standing is better than squatting because you're gonna be able to move faster and, and so on and so forth. Um, again, this is a this is a really good drill. Um, but again, when you train at that high level, uh, we risk injury, right? Like we risk slipping, we risk falling, especially in these conditions where everybody is around that same vehicle. So then, what? It becomes muddy because everybody spin their dip, or it rains. And you slip and bust your ass, and everybody's got the high speed Solomons, but sometimes they don't save you. Um, so hell, even this guy's got the high speed Solomons, but you gotta understand that things, things happen. And so how do we prevent that? But not only that, how can we still perform at a high level while making uh, games, games in our accessory work in the gym? So obviously some people they'll train so hard in the gym, they'll get to work and then they won't be able to do shit because they're so sore because they, they did, 10 sets of 10 of Romanian deadlifts uh, at 225. And they're like, man, my hamstring is sore. They're going to be sore for four days. That's a, that's, you know, that's a lot of volume. So this is when I'm going to incorporate Dr. Matt and Coach, and Coach D, if he's still there, um, through about training with injury. Because this is a still thing. And some people say, oh, I'm injured. I can't train. I got to take time off work. I'm going to lose all my gains. I can't attend this class. But believe it or not, sometimes movement is the answer. And I'll let Coach Matt kind of take over from here. Yeah. Did we, did we post? Uh, you kind of broke up there, boss. Can you? Matt, you frozen? I I can't hear you, man. I see you. You look great. Uh, can Can Dane take it away? Dane. Yeah, absolutely. Did you um did you ask a uh, question, Adam? Yeah. So um, so, so what I was saying was um, you know, how do we get that that? How, can we still train through injury, or is it like you know, if we if we have pain, should I just stop moving? Should I rest? Like, because we know we have to keep progressing um, with our training and our everybody wants gains. So is there a way or how should people approach training with injury? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, if we're training like we should be, there's always going to be points of time where uh, we have, uh, you know, aches and pains come up and sometimes they're going to be greater than others. But, you know, the, the key is kind of knowing your body and, and kind of understanding your relationship with pain and, and looking at it from a standpoint of, just because we uh, have a, a certain amount of pain doesn't mean we need to stop. We can usually push into a range, you know, if we're talking about a 10 point scale, 
you know, up to that level of three or four out of 10 on a pain scale, you know, during a workout or throughout our workout, um, as long as we don't encounter like these really sharp, sudden um, changes in pain um, that might, you know, be really sharp to like a six or a seven out of 10 and then back down, um, you know, that's, that's somewhat cause for concern. And then the other thing is, is if, if this pain has been going on for longer than 24 hours, you know, if you get to that pain level of three or four, and it seems to be like that for, for longer than 24 hours, then yeah, we've got to, we've got to kind of step back, uh, take a, take a look at what our stress levels like. Is it work? Is it, is it home? Is it, I've been pushing really hard in the gym. Like we have to kind of evaluate where areas are that we can kind of dial back that stress. The easiest way to do it if we're talking about the gym is just by cutting that volume or cutting that, uh, you know, that load and kind of taking a step back for a couple of days until you get that pain to be back under that two or three out of 10. Um, and, and as long as it stays there or below, um, you know, you should be able to continue pressing on and, and not be really fearing of injury um, and, and still focusing on performance at that time. Yeah, and that's and and that's exactly what we want. So, so uh, guys, Coach Dane, I know you can't see his face. Um, extremely experienced uh, with performance athletes. Um, so, essentially, what he said was, keep training, and if you're having issues, either either try different movement patterns, or um, you know you can still, you can kind of still progress in other areas. So you don't have to essentially just stop it all together. Um, and I think that's, I think, I think that's a really common misconception, unless you're just a, a fucking sandbagger and you just don't want to work or you don't want to train and you just want to suck, then that's fine. <laughs> then go ahead and take your time off or whatever. But for, for those who want to keep progressing, don't, don't stop training. Um, you know, unless it's to that point where, where it is pretty high on that pain scale, and then you should definitely go seek medical attention. Um, yeah. And this is- Can you hear me? Probably the, Can you hear me yeah. now? Yep, yeah, I got you, Matt. All right, go back up to that slide one more time. Yes, so sir. So I want to have uh, the changing- Do we need you again? What I mean by that is, let's say a, did, I, did you lose me? You're good. Did you lose me? Yeah, you're good. I'm good? Okay, good. So um, yeah, it, let's say a squat, a barbell back squat hurts or that, that, that increases your pain of a three, it becomes four, it becomes five, it starts as you do more reps, it becomes stronger and stronger. Well, how does a front squat feel? Okay, how does a heels elevated squat feel? How does a goblet squat feel? How does a split squat, a lunge, there's all these different variations that are still a, a squatting pattern that you can do that may not hurt at all. The same thing would go with any upper body pressing. Maybe a bell strict press or dumbbell seal. What if you rotate the dumbbells out slightly? There's so many ways that you can vary movement and, and have completely different outcomes. Even let's just go back to the back squat example. Okay, back squats hurt. What if you move your feet out water? What if you move them closer together? What if you point your feet out wide? What if, uh, what if you lower the bar on your back? There's so many different ways you can, you can tweak a movement. And a lot of times if I tweak it, it feels better and you can just keep training. It's as simple as that. Yeah, absolutely, man. I appreciate that. It just made me think too of the load, you know, like a lot of times I'll either change positions or I will back down load until it feels good again. And to, you know, until I don't have that, that rise in pain and uh, I could do a set there and then maybe even add again. It's just, it's just always just kind of tinkering with it until you find a position or a load or a range of motion that uh, doesn't hurt. Yeah. And I, guys, I, you got guys again, I mean, you heard it from, you heard it from the people that know a lot more than Ralph and I. So um, this is, this is why the combination uh, works. Um, we essentially present them, with what we do, issues, problems, and then they get they get a taste of it, and then they they're like, hey, this is this is how we can optimize performance. This is how we can keep growing, um, even even while um, rehabilitating an injury. Um, and that's that's something you gotta do. Um, 
Matt, we'll go ahead. This is this is kind of Matt's meat and potatoes. Dr. Matt is is the head programmer for EFT. Uh, Coach Dane does the programming. Uh, I believe he did all the programming for the body weight stuff, uh, which is which is extremely. I did that today and it kicked my ass. It was freaking brutal. Um, but yeah, guys. So we're going to talk just about the, about kind of like the three core principles uh, of to kind of why we program. I'll go ahead and hit the first one since it's not really like. Um, I can kind of talk on it. I don't. I, I won't feel stupid because I'm not like a doctor. But um, but in the sense of this, so guys, the purpose of effective fitness is to become effective. Is to be well rounded. We know that if you're super duper strong, but you can't run 40 yards. Uh, you know, in at least I'd probably say six seconds, then you're probably a liability. Like you have to be able to perform multiple tasks in multiple environments. Um, under multiple conditions. So you have to understand that the the ability to perform is the goal here. Um, no matter what, no matter what the situation, we know that we cannot prepare for every single situation. That's just the reality of training. But we do know that we can prepare ourselves uh, to where that, the again, the data gives us the direction as to where we should train and how we should train to actually be well-rounded and be prepared for reality. But again, the minimal effective dose is if you're not doing the minimal effective dose and you're a first responder, then you were wrong. So I'll have Dr. Matt go ahead and take that one away. Yes, minimal effective dose is really that is be prepared for being able to, to respond to situations on our feet and we don't want our training of 10 by 10 RDLs to crush our souls and not allow us to, to do those things. So our training should 100% supplement our life and it should make our life rather than crushing you with hour long, hour and hour and a half long, two hour long workouts, which would actually make you less mentally sharp, would make you less physically sharp. It would it, it'll not allow you to be the best first responder, law enforcement officer you can be. We find that if we can attack a minimum effective dose and allow you to progress that way, then you can achieve much more outside of the gym, which is really what matters. If I can get through doing a 35 to 60 minute workout and I can get more results and life outside is better, that's, 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 that's all we want right there, right? So we use the minimal effective dose for training here. We, we don't do a, like our, our training volume, we, we, we spread it out throughout the week so you're not overloaded every single session. You'll be sore by, by all means, but we don't do a lot of, like if you guys are, are following it and you've seen the strength program, uh, typically we'll have one heavy set per day and then we'll have some back down drop off set. So it may be work up to one heavy set of five and then I want you to take 10 to 15% of the weight off of the bar. I want you to do that for another two sets. So we're getting that one strong stimulus and then the other ones are, are just getting in repetitions, right? So minimal effective dose and, and the strength from, that's how we use it. And really a lot of our, our, our programming has a strength movement. It has two to three accessory movements. And those are really based off of what the, these guys talked about earlier is your knees are gonna travel past your toes when you're lunging, lateral lunging past, past like there was one of, the video, one of the pictures up there uh, when, the, when one of the officers was, was lunging past the uh, the back side of the car, his knee was clearly traveling past his toe. So we're going to do single leg lateral lunges. We're going to do single leg step ups. We're going to do lunges, forward lunges. We'll do backward lunges. We'll do like uh, Cossack squat lunges, which transfers very well to be staying low and transferring your weight from one side to the other. So a lot of our accessory movement is where we get more of our volume actually in and that accessory work stuff is to improve your mobility because it's, it's loaded. You have a loaded weight or, or, or you're going through a full range of motion under distress. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's everything we have with effective dose. Yeah, I mean, and that's, and that's something extremely important. That's something that I wish I would have learned uh, years ago because Contrary to popular belief, sometimes more is not better. And we have had multiple, multiple members say they've tried program X and it completely destroyed them. And they were actually having trouble to perform um, at work. They're having 
trouble sleeping uh, because just like just like Dr. Matt said, it actually does uh, it does not make you as sharp because it just becomes daunting and redundant. Um, so for those guys who are spending two or three hours in the gym, um, unless you're trying to get away from your wife or your boyfriend or whatever, then cool. But if you're if your goal is to actually train and get the most out of it, then you should be training the minimal effective dose because you're still going to make gains and you're still going to be able to live and be able to walk the next day. Because if guys, yeah, it it is it is life changing. Um, again, apply the third and most important is the schedule and education, the consistency of training. If you're not training consistently, you're not going to progress. Um, you know, and this is this is important, and it's okay if you miss a day. Um, here and there, make it up, do something. But, excuse me, even on rest days, rest days don't exist at Effective Fitness. We have active rest days, which means we do something active. Um, but again, guys, also the evolving science, the research, and the data to give direction is extremely important because if you don't know what you're training for, um, then why are you training? So you have to understand, like, if it's going to make you, uh, if it's going to give you the advantage then, then you should be trained that way. And this is, and this is why we drive our fitness. And this is why you, we are here to build a solid foundation so that you are the advantage. That's it. There is no, there's no if, ands, or buts around action, right? Action is king. So we're going to go down. We're going to open up the Q and a, um, is that in the chat, Matt, or is there an actual Q and a, but it will be, it will be in the chat. So there, there's a Q and A button on the uh, on the, the chat. Bottom. Okay, chat polls. So, Here we go. Yeah. Am I? So like uh, I know Jose asked if um, okay. you know, if the recording was going to be available. Let's see. So no questions right now, correct? Do you guys have any questions? Please don't hesitate to ask. Um, oh, there's one. You just type in dot, dot, dot. Uh, well, okay. We will answer that live. Sure. Um, here, here you go. What are some active rest things I can do at the house? Um, me personally, I like to go run with the dog, uh, play with the dog. I, I always like to do some type of dry fire with like incorporating some type of super light, uh, Medcon, um, I tend to, I personally, for me, I like to pick something up moderately heavy uh, just a few times, just because I like to. Uh, but those are just some things I know. Ralph, Ralph, Matt, Dane, what do y'all like to do? Yeah, I like, um, I'm always trying to improve my, my mobility. Again, the only way you're really gonna test yourself and how your body is prepared and, and what you need to continue to work on is, is to train, is to, is to go out there and and perform in activities. And my activity might be so we can warrior softball with, with, with the homies, or it might be attending another one of Will's training or um, Jason Pletter from GCS. It might be, uh, by the way, in June, we're hosting fatigue management for everybody out there in Los Angeles, out here in SoCal, fatigue management. Go to gcstraininggroup.com and sign up. All right, with that being said, I like to do a lot of down regulation breathing, right? Going back to what we said in the very beginning is how can we mitigate stress symptoms by breathing, breathing technique. I like to do the four second in, four second hold, four second out, four second hold. I'm controlling my heart rate. I'm lowering my heart rate. Again, and just by practicing that, you're going to apply that into a high stress, even a moderate stress situation. Like, oh crap, my, my girlfriend or wife's going into labor. Oh shit, I just got shot. So your ability to to breathe, right? It shouldn't be the first time when you're on the field experiencing something. You're gonna, you're gonna be all over the place. So what I like to do is I like to do some down regulation by, by breathing. And I think, and that's only, not only gonna help you relax, de, de-stress, but help you whenever high stress incident you're involved in. Good question. <laughs> that's good, good, good. Uh, do we need more examples or you wanna move on or, sorry? Yeah, let, yeah, let's just move on. Um, does the EFT program account for equipment availability or is it generic stuff and we find our own alternatives? 
Good thing for you is that um, we only require basic equipment, um, basic gym equipment, but also um, we, we also do have a bodyweight program and it looks like Dane wants to go ahead and talk a little about that because I, I know he is, he is the man behind the bodyweight program. So, Yeah, so I, I mean, for every day now, there is a bodyweight option as well as uh, the, the normal effective fitness program that would be carried out in your typical kind of gym that has a barbell or a dumbbell or a kettlebell. Um, but, uh, within the app, there's also the option, um, if you needed to modify, say one of the movements, because you didn't have a piece of equipment, you can actually open and, um, swap an exercise, um, you know, to make it fit with, within the program, if you needed to, in terms of alternatives. So you've got the body weight option, you've got the option to kind of do, uh, your best with all the equipment you have, and then you've got the option to switch an exercise if needed, um, if you don't have that and, and need an alternative. Right. And you can also always go in the form and you can ask coach Kelly, coach Matt, uh, Dane, myself, Ralph, we're always in the chats guys. So if you ever have any questions, we have, we have the form on the, uh, on the app and make sure you guys, make sure you guys use that thoughts on running long distance with a weighted vest or duty gear. Uh, me personally, um, I've, Long distances, uh, I don't like to run anything probably more than an 800 uh, with, with gear, um, only because why? Um, that's that's, that's kind of my point. I'm okay with you running sprints or, you know, 20-yard intervals with the vest on just to kind of see what kind of moves around. It's, it's definitely good to wear your gear, try it, do sprints, uh, see what – falls off, see what you don't need. Cause you see some of these guys, they got all this gear popped out like 16 inches on their chest. And the first time they get in a foot pursuit, like there goes your flashlight, there goes a rifle mag, there goes, there goes all kinds of stuff, right? And you just lost, you know, you know, $200 and shit off your vest that you probably didn't need anyways. Um, so uh, from, from a actual standpoint, I, I don't see anything wrong with it. I personally uh, don't do it any more than 800 meter, but I'm sure Dr. Matt and Coach D can kind of fill us in on probably what that does uh, to your knees and your lower back and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I can take it. I can take it. Um, Yeah, so I I think, you know, just like anything else, um, our body – adapts to the to the load and the and the you know the requirements that we're placing on it so um you know if you've been running and you're a runner and you decide that you want to throw on a vest and go run the same distance that you normally run probably a bad idea um just because you're changing the stimulus and it's going to be a a a rapid increase in load you know every one of those steps that you take while running can be between uh, two and five times your body weight, depending on um, how fast you're running. So if you are thinking about every load and you add a 10 or a 20 or a 30 pound vest onto that load, um, and, and now you multiply that over the course of a mile or more or two or 10 or 30, depending on how long you're talking about distance um, being, that's gonna be an enormous amount of volume. So if you wanna add a vest to your running, Distance doesn't matter, but you've got to start just like you're starting to run. You've got to go 400, 800, a mile, you know, 10 minutes, 13 minutes, 15 minutes, and continue to progress over time. You just don't go from zero to 100. Other than yeah, that, the body should hold up fine as long as you do that progression. That's, again, guys, progression. It's very important. Um, do you recommend investing in a heart rate monitor for training? I personally um, have never worn one. Um, I, I think they do serve a, a, a purpose, but I, I have very limited knowledge on that. So I'll let, again, the medical professionals handle that one. Sure. I'll take this one. So, um, the heart rate monitor can be helpful when you're first starting out training, like, uh, like Ralph was saying earlier that it, it's good to know when you're, when you're getting close to that red line, but it's, it's almost just like tracking food using macros and everything like that. Like it's a good thing to help you realize where your baseline is at but a heart rate monitor for a long-term use just like tracking macros for a long time use is not really sustainable and it's really just meticulous and not necessarily that needed so um if you don't have one 
I mean, I, I bought one because I thought it would be a good idea. I'll use it maybe a few times a year just just to just to use it, but I don't think it's it's needed. Yeah, save your money and uh, spend it on EFT. There you go. Um, I have interior pelvic tilt. I've been doing some exercises to strengthen it out. But do you have any specific advice or exercises for it or training with it to straighten it out? What you guys handle that one? No. No. <laughs> no. I mean, I don't think it's uh, necessarily a, a problem. Um, but that's just that's my interpretation of the current literature and research. Is a lot of things you're you, you maybe designed that way. So it's kind of hard to say. Is like, did you did did that develop over a long period of time? Did you always have that? And is that truly a problem? And is that creating pain, discomfort, and other things down the chain? I would be probably more on the side of no, but like, just like Dane mentioned with running and wearing a weighted vest is progressing over a long period of time is more important than, is the biggest reason we have pain. I'm going to, I attached the video on YouTube. I'm going to post that in the chat here in a second. And that really does kind of break down like why we experience pain. A lot of Can you hear me? You're kind of breaking up, though. All right, where did, where did I, where did I stop? <laughs> Remix. Um, <clears throat> uh, Matt, you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, I got you now. All right, where did I stop? Where did, where did I get messy? You're it's gonna... About, it's talking about YouTube. Oh. Okay, so, so yeah, I'm gonna post something in the chat here. It's called Load Versus Capacity. And it kind of breaks down the concepts of why we experience pain from a purely loading standpoint. And um, we, we've always been told it's our flat feet that's causing back pain. It's, uh, yeah, you, your, your arches are collapsed. Your knees are caved in. That's why you have knee pain. And if, if you look at marathon runners or elite athletes, a lot of them don't move perfectly. And it's more because they built this base over a long period of time to where they can handle the certain movement patterns without having pain or discomfort. So I'm, I'm much more on, on, the, um, on, on the other side of, I don't think things need to be fixed. I think we need to learn how to... Yeah, that's probably good, Adam. We can move on. I think, okay. you know... He He's on the side that uh, we can fix through movement, just get stronger, sure. more resilient, and uh, you Absolutely. know most things will work itself out. I like it. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and move on. Uh, what Cod and Joe's can do? Ralph looks like he kind of wants to take that one. Uh, Ralph. Yeah. So some some of the drills uh, th again. This is this is something that um, the admins uh, we give to our programmers. Say, hey, here's here's a cognitive drill, and here's why. Because when it comes to a high stressful incident, right, whether you're a first responder or where, where you're a civilian, what do we have to do? We got to problem solve, okay? That's, that's, that's important. We got to call 911 or we got to call dispatch. What do we need? What do we have? What do you got, right? We have to relay the information, okay? So we, we got to come problem solvers. So some of the drills that I like to complete, or we just had it, what, last week is memory card drills. Okay, that's a great cognitive exercise. All you have to do is take three cards. Actually, I have cards here. Take three cards, remember their numbers, remember the suit, look at them for, I don't know, however long it takes you to memorize them, put them away. You'll do the prescribed interval, right? At the end of it, you have to recite it out loud or write it down. I typically like to write it down because that's what I like to do. I like to write things down. You'll complete the prescribed interval again, and then you'll remember that same suit of car three cards and do the same thing over and over again. But the whole point of all that is we have to be able to slow our heart rate down, to think, to become problem solvers, to remember. Again, that's one of the um, uh, symptoms of high stress is we start to lose memory. We can't retain it, right? Short-term memory is, or excuse me, yeah, short-term memory becomes, uh, becomes an issue, okay? So cognitive exercises, uh, or even looking at maps, right? Looking at, uh, you know, 
I got a huge map here that I'm going to scale down. So maybe we can apply to the effective fitness program, but it's basically a room. How are you going to problem solve this room? What are the areas that are danger? Where, where are you going to go? You're going to get a marker. You're going to draw right as you control your heart rate. And as soon as you're done, you know, you can either, uh, go over it by yourself or go over with the family member and say, here's the best way, you know, to navigate through this room. Okay. You don't got to be some tactician. It's just, what do you think? It's just getting you to slow your heart rate down and be able to problem solve. So those are some of the ones that, uh, what are you guys saying? What do you, what do you guys got for cognitive drills? Yeah, I, I, I think that's great. I think that's, uh, I mean, you know, obviously we go into depth about this in our program. So if you guys are more interested in the cognitive drills, uh, check us out. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to keep going on. We're going to, the best martial arts to add in your training and why. I personally train jujitsu. Um, there are other great martial arts out there. Definitely in, incorporate some type of grappling, uh, some type of stand up, Muay Thai, um, something like that, that is legitimate. Um, but also our programming is designed so that you can still work out and it's actually going to benefit your other accessory work um, like martial arts training. Um, we're going to go to the next question here. Are you guys incorporating combatives training on a weekly basis in your program? And how? So we are not a, a combatives. We are effective fitness, but our fitness is designed to help you progress with your hands-on training. Um, a lot of our, a lot of our members do train jujitsu or are getting into jujitsu. And we do focus a lot on stability and, and agility. And if you ever train jujitsu, you know that stability is extremely important as well as balance and mobility. Strength is good as well. Um, but especially when it comes to the, the actual hands-on side, stability is extremely important. Um, see here, are you guys incorporating where it's that one? Um, how important is footwear for running training? I've been told to use minimalist shoes for less cushioning. Dane, this is all you, my man. Uh, yeah, I guess um, footwear doesn't really matter. I mean, the current current literature that we've been looking at, um, you know, footwear in and of itself doesn't seem to have any impact on, um, you know, injury risk reduction or you know, uh, even, you know, more, it would probably be more closely related to performance wise, uh, if you look at the, the research, but um, no, don't, don't worry about the shoes too much. The most important thing to really think about with shoes is what is most comfortable. So um, obviously, you know, if you've been running in a certain type of shoe for a long time and somebody told you to go to minimalist, um, that's going to be a big change. And one is probably going to feel more comfortable to you than the other and i'd say stick with the comfort the minimalist shoes isn't going to do anything for you um it's not going to make you necessarily run better um you know i again it's all about progressing you know making sure that whatever shoe you're wearing you wear it over a period of time if you've just recently changed your type of shoe making sure that you kind of reset your training slightly and and you know make sure that you are equipped to handle that style of shoe if you go from a big cushion to a zero cushion you know, um, all of these things are going to impact the way you run. And again, it's about progressing back to that mean, back to that normal status. And then from there, you can, you can progress beyond. And, but don't focus too much on the shoes. Don't go out and change. If you're feeling some pain and that's why you're asking about shoes, we got to look elsewhere and then kind of figure out what that root cause is. And again, make it stronger, make it more, uh, you know, uh, resilient and you'll be back in the gym and back running. No problem. Awesome. Awesome. Matt, I'm going to handle this one. Um, how can I program so that I give so that I can gain strength in the gym yet remain solid on my endurance and mobility? What should the weekly training split look like? We just made a video on this and we're, we're going to post it here soon, but doc, it's all you. Yeah, yeah. So we'll break this into a few few parts here. Um, part one is remain solid on mobility. So mobility is something that I incorporate in all my warm ups and cool downs. And if you're part of the effective fitness program, you'll see that is there's always a five ten minute warm up and five ten minute cool down where that's built in. And if you get stronger, you're not going to lose mobility. That's a that's a myth that doesn't doesn't hold up. You are going to adapt to positions you're in the most. 
So if you're practicing full range of motion squats and deadlifts, you're going to have full range of motion of your hips in those planes. Same thing with like lateral lunges, like you're going to have full range of motion in your hip that way too. Um, so mobility will stay there as long as you continue to work on it, but that should be something that you're daily doing is you're consciously always doing different loaded movements throughout the joints, full range of motion. Um, in, in regards to strength, um, we've I mentioned it earlier in here is that we typically do one main strength movement a day. We split to give you an example. Mondays are typically a deadlift day, a hinge day, and then we'll have some extents that we position or lateral lunges. So something that's going to put a different range of motion or it could be some hip thrusts or glute bridges, something like that. But we're gonna be doing primarily hinge. Can you all still hear me good? Am I still okay? Yep. Cool. All right. So, they put we'll be, we'll some sort of soon. upper body pressing movement. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you're good. All right. Tuesday would be an upper body pressing day or a single arm unilateral work day. We really work on the upper back. And then we incorporate some running in that day. Wednesday is our off day. On Thursday, we have um, back squats and more unilateral work. On Fridays is just an upper body bro day. We want you to feel good. I got some bench press in there. And then on Saturday is where we have most of our, our, our tactical work. So a lot of stuff we covered in here, the cognitive drills, we put those in on Saturdays. They're typically longer workouts. They're meant for really being able to control your heart rate and um, being able to continuously move and pace yourself over a long period of time or through multiple workouts in that session. So I got the, the answer to that. That was just kind of giving you an overview of what, what our program looks like. But if you're really interested in learning what it's, what it's about, I mean, I would just do a two week free trial and look, learn our system, just go through two weeks of it and you'll kind of get an idea for. We yeah, do keep yeah, that yeah. same consistent schedule. Of, we keep that same consistent schedule for at least 12 weeks. And then we may change up. Okay. Uh, we're not going to do strict press. Like the next cycle we're going to do on Tuesday, the main movement is pull-ups but we still have that main consistent pull-up movement for 12 weeks because we have to build each week. So having that consistent schedule of every Tuesday is my pull-up day or my push press day. I'm continuing to build and wait throughout that 12 weeks. And then when that's over, I'll go back up and I'll start up with higher reps and lighter weight again. And I continue to build, build, build for 12 weeks and then start again. Um, like, like the admin, we're going to be posting a video on this pretty shortly. We met this week. I, I pretty much anybody through a 12-week progression um, on like how to yeah how, how to build strength. Right. Yeah. It's a guys. It's a really good video. Um, if you are interested in the program, just like Dr. Matt said, we have a two-week free trial. Um, if you don't like it, you can cancel anytime. Um, we're going to go ahead and take the next and last questions. Um, here we go. Do you have an do you have any academy prep programs? We do have an academy prep program. Uh, you go to our website, you go to our Instagram page, click on the link. Um, we have we have a 12 week academy prep program. Um, but send us a DM if you have any particular questions about the academy prep. We'll be more than happy to answer them. Um, we got another question here. Thanks to the webinar. What are your guys' thoughts on kettlebell workouts and incorporating them in bodyweight workouts? or hit Metcons. I absolutely love kettlebell stuff, um, but I'll go ahead and let Dr. Matt um, go ahead and answer that. Yeah, I love kettlebells too. We actually filmed another video on the kettlebell swing uh, earlier, That's to yeah, earlier That's this week, soon. same day. Yeah, and um, same thing, man. It, it's just uh, it, use, having a movement that allows you to stay in like this nice constant momentum it just feels really good on the body, the joints, and um, I love them. I think they're they're a great way to incorporate some training. And I, I like doing kettlebell swings, even for like higher reps, so 15 reps plus, just maintaining that movement yeah. and swinging. It's almost, it's almost right. uh, 
yeah, it's almost just relaxing and methodical and the yeah. actual movement of self, even like a kettlebell swing, a kettlebell clean, a kettlebell snatch. You just feel overall athletic. So I don't know. <laughs> For me personally, Smooth. like uh, yeah. Dane can know this, like I'll just go pick up a kettlebell and just start swinging it throughout the day sometimes just because it feels good. I'll, I'll swing it. I'll do some squats. I'll move around. I feel good. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend the kettlebell swing or just kettlebell work in general. Yeah, and you can buy relatively cheap, guys. If you're looking for equipment, we know that some gyms are slowly opening right now, but Facebook Marketplace is a great way to buy equipment. I buy basically all my equipment off of, off of Facebook, and I know kettlebells are so, they're extremely versatile, um, and they're relatively inexpensive. So um, that's all the questions that we have today. Um, guys, the people that are still watching, we really appreciate you guys uh for joining us uh we were we have recorded this so we will make a podcast uh or and we're probably going to save the zoom call from this as well um so again guys we'll, we'll be doing this again if you have any ideas of topics you would like covered please send us a dm uh on instagram if not guys check us out effective fitness effective dot fitness um that is our website and then off obviously you should be following effective dot fitness training Guys, you guys have anything to say? Any closing statements? Yeah, hey, thanks. This is this was legit. Yeah, I hope to do this again. Appreciate everybody who participated. All the folks that took off. I see one question here when it comes to mentally oh. trained for high stress. Jonathan, hey John, hit us a DM. I'll I'll get back to you on that, man. As soon as I can tonight, okay? Na any LAPD in here? Uh, Ralph's in LA, but he is not LAPD. Um, but. But yeah, guys, all right, guys, really appreciate your time. If you have any questions, shoot us a DM. We'll get back to you within 12 to 24 hours. All right, guys, thank you. Later. Thanks, everybody. See you.